Hello and welcome to Japan Expert Insights and our Business Insights Forum. Every Thursday, Tim Sullivan and I, Maya Matsuoka, lead a discussion looking for insights, developments, and new opportunities for the business in Japan. In this podcast, we welcome comments, questions, and opinions. So if you haven't done so yet, join us next time. In the meantime, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel, where we upload all the discussions on Japanese politics, business insights, and the Japan's role in the Indo-Pacific region. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, today, we've got Peter Gibson, and we invited Peter to uh, talk about the legacy of the Tokyo Olympics uh, this time. Of course, uh, for us who live and work in Japan, um, well, probably the Olympic uh, Games have uh, different connotations, but uh, we cannot... Uh, uh, not recognize the fact that the Olympics, uh, they were indeed a success uh, in in terms of logistics, in terms of uh, performance of the athletes, and uh, even more so were the Paralympic Games uh, last year in summer. Uh, Peter is uh, executive director uh, to the Tokyo Olympic and Paralympic Games uh, in the Australian Com Olympic Committee. Um, so Peter uh, came to Tokyo last year with the Paralympian team of Australia and uh, we would like to hear, uh, well, his uh, stories about uh, the games uh, last year, the athletes, of course, and uh, let's begin. Peter. Oh, thanks, Maya. Um, just a very quick shout out. Hello, Frank Foley, you legend, you. Um, great to see that you're in the in the group. Um, uh, uh, my co-carbine club of T Tokyo member. Um, so, uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me on. Uh, we had this clubhouse, I think, before uh, the Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics kicked off. Um, and I think one of the major words that we discussed at that particular time was apprehension, uh, whether the Games will actually be beneficial. Um, one of the comments I did make at that time was a very simple one, is I felt as soon as the Games got going, uh, both the Olympics and the Paralympics, that the Japanese public would sort of turn a tide, if you like, as far as popular opinion. Um, once the Japanese athletes started to perform uh, and brought that sort of Olympic or Paralympic spirit into the households of not only Japan, but the world, uh, I think you'll find there'll be a, a big change in uh, public sentiment. And I think I was proven true. Now looking back on those two, which is the, you know, the biggest events in the world or sporting world. And as we look at Beijing, with the Winter Olympics proceeding at the moment. Um, it's given me a little bit of a chance to review the experience that I had in Japan. Um, and with Japan being my second home, I think it was, we left uh, three, four weeks before the Paralympics. So I went up there with a special crew. I jumped on a Japan Airlines flight at Sydney Airport here, and uh, we were only one of 15 uh, in, the, uh, in, in the plane. Um, one of the most emotional moments I think I've ever had is that I hadn't been to Japan uh, for obvious reasons, uh, since November of 2019, um, and then flying back into uh, to Tokyo, we actually came in over Maihama. Uh, normally, the A and A flight from Sydney might come into Tokyo Bay from the south, but we came in over Maihama, which took us directly on our right hand side. And I happened to be on the right hand side, took us directly over uh, Shiba Koen in that area there, and I saw at night uh, the Tokyo Tower lit up and immediately burst into tears. So I'm a very big softie uh, when it comes to my second home. And to be able to uh, participate with the Australian Olympic team of some 400 strong uh, in the Paralympic Games and the Olympic Games uh, in the village. And then, although obviously with COVID restrictions, not like any other games we've ever had, um, was certainly a culmination of six years of probably one of the highlights of my career or definitely one of the highlights of my career. Um, I'm happy to take you know questions throughout the uh, the clubhouse today, and I really want to see if it's a possible we have a bit of an exchange. I've got some videos that I would like to share with you later. One in particular, uh, I think, epitomises uh, the the values, resilience, strength, determination um, of the Japanese people and the Japanese culture, which we all uh, adore and love. Um, but I'd like to share a couple of little stories about how uh, how things sort of started to unravel, not unravel, but un unveil themselves as we got there. Um, we made a decision very early on with the medical team that our um, our Paralympic team was not going to be using the dining hall as we found that the uh, risk of COVID there was probably at its highest. Uh, and you would have noticed that the Australian team also didn't actually uh, march in the opening nor the closing ceremonies, just our flag bearers. Uh, to say that spending two weeks uh, in the Olympic, or the Paralympic village with 300 or so athletes with a disability was a, a life-changing sort of experience uh, is probably an understatement. Uh, those of you who know me, uh, you may also know that I also have a child with a disability. I have a 24-year-old son with Down syndrome and autism. 
Uh, so a disability was not unknown to me, uh, but uh, to be in a village there, which was literally uh, 5,000 people in that village, and myself as an able-bodied person was on the vast minority. Uh, so I think that was one of the most incredible experiences that, that I had had. Um, are we still all there, Maya? I just think you messaged me. Oh, this is great. No, yeah. continue, please. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. I just didn't. Uh, well, I had a look, so nobody's actually nobody nobody's actually bugged out. So that's a good thing. Um, so when when you talk when our Australian uh, Paralympic team comes together, you've got to realise that you've got uh, about approximately thirty or so sports that have oftentimes never met each other. So they're coming together. The Australian style of what we do is we call it the mob. Uh, so the mob comes together and some of these athletes have been there for the first time. Some of them, it was their fourth or fifth Paralympics to see those athletes uh, with different disabilities start to moving into the vi village. You could imagine that, uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, an Olympic Games, and, and I think this is with the greatest respect, uh, the Olympic Games with able-bodied, you have the needs and necessities that you have to actually cater for is quite a narrow, I suppose, bandwidth. And with the Paralympic Games, we're talking about a, a myriad of issues that you've got to overcome. Um, one of those ones I was just referring to with the dining hall um, was we decided not to use that. So one of my jobs, and I think uh, I look back at it now, um, wasn't fun at the time, uh, but my job was to actually work with a, a company called Mel Corporation in Japan, which is based out at, I think it's Setagayaku, who I found through the Rugby World Cup. And they were uh, sports nutritionists and, and caterers. Uh, we had to supply the Australian Paralympic team with 900 meals a day, which met the dietary requirements and also the nutrition requirements of uh, Paralympic athletes. So you can imagine this was not just going down to um, Hoka Hoka and getting a bento box. Let's, I'll order 900 of those and get those delivered. It was a completely different kettle of fish. So it's very stressful, but we got there. And uh, as usual, uh, the Japanese supplier came through with some, we had some teething problems in the first day or two. We adjusted those, um, and overall, the, uh, the 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 results were well. The results speak for themselves. We had nobody with any food poisoning problems or anything like that. The only issue we ever had uh, was when our basketball team played Iran in the first uh, first round, and then uh, an Iranian player actually tested positive. We had to then completely change our apartment in the in the at the Paralympic Village and move our entire. We'd, we'd actually set up the ninth floor as our um, quarantine floor if anything had gone wrong. Um, and this was one case that it did. And we had to move our entire basketball team from all their rooms straight into the ninth floor uh, for isolation. Um, we had obviously, one of my other roles was uh, was uh, PCR tests uh, every single day for um, all of our, well, actually, which was our rapid antigen test at that time, uh, for all, every single one of our athletes and officials every day. So that was, as I look back on it now, I sometimes wonder how our team got through it, but. Um, as they say, you know, a committed group of human beings can achieve anything. Um, some of the highlights from a Japanese perspective, and I like to, as I said, I like to think of Japan as my second home. Um, I swelled with pride uh, the amount of feedback that I received, not only from the Australian Olympic, uh, Paralympic Olympic team, but also the officials. Um, the highlight of that, those comments and remarks about Japan, and let's keep this bear in mind that the majority of people that were actually in that Olympic village were visiting Japan for the first time. Uh, the remark from our chef to mission. Uh, now, he's a man who doesn't say too much. Uh, he's very quiet. He came up to me quietly at one stage and he said, you know, this is the only country in the world he'd done several Olympic and, and winter Olympic and uh, summer Olympics. And he said, this is the only country in the world that could have or would have pulled this off. Uh, and that really mean, meant a lot to me because it showed me just what Japan is capable of doing uh, even when things are not going the right way. Um, he'd been in Brazil, he'd been in Athens, um, and with the greatest respect to those countries, etc. he made the comment to me, he said, if this had been Brazil or if this had been Athens or Greece, they would have put their hands in the air and said, no, nah, we're too much, we can't do this, we've got to cancel the games, no matter what the consequences are. The powers that be, um, TOCOG uh, and for the Olympic and Paralympic Games, etc., did an exceptional job. The venues were, in the athletes' words, and I can only go from the athletes, the venues were the best they had ever come across anywhere in the world. Uh, and we've got numerous world champions, uh, numerous athletes that spend 48 weeks of the year away from Australia, traveling the world. The, the volunteers uh, were incredible. The officials were amazing. Uh, there was, I was in meetings every single day about incident reports, et cetera, and things like that. But there was never anything that came up uh, that was not doable uh, from the Japanese perspective. 
I sometimes criticize Japan when I'm doing my consultancies in that uh, sometimes once things are decided uh, and the plan is agreed upon, that there's little wiggle, wiggle room or flexibility to change uh, the um, uh, change the plan. Uh, what I felt, what I found in Japan uh, throughout the Paralympics was the ability to adjust uh, the chose ryoku, the ability to adjust, the ability to change, the ability to mould um, and to make things happen uh, was quite amazing. I had one incident where I had uh, the CEO of the Paralympics um, could not get into a particular venue um, and we kept going up the chain, up the chain and we still couldn't find uh, the, the bucho who was in charge of that particular responsibility. Um, and that was the only thing that ever really sort of challenged uh, challenged me that was no flexibility. Apart from that, was just incredible. Village itself was, as you can imagine, amazing. Um, we walked in, uh, and I'm happy to share the, the the photos and videos later. I hope my explanation does it justice. But we came into the welcome village, into the welcome uh, court and arena, and that was completely made of wood, uh, and it was wood which was stamped where, where, wherever that wood had come from throughout Japan. Um, it was Fukushima Ken, it was Saga Ken, it was Mie Ken, it was Oita, it was Kagoshima, it was Iwate, Miyage, Miyagi, uh, you know, Aomori, Akita, you know, you name it, um, Ibaraki, and it was just wonderful. And I pointed those out to all of the team as they were coming through. Uh, the facilities were great. The, the rooms, which are now being transformed into apartments or mansion uh, in Japan there in Harumi and selling, I think, uh, already uh, oversold. Each of the rooms was actually then decked out in cardboard beds and it was really it didn't give you that feel that for example that it was going to be something which was cheap and nasty um it was not that at all the air weave beds were fantastic the way in which and they'd actually put up most of the temporary rooms within the apartments so you could see the classic sort of three ldk style of an apartment which was actually housing sort of eight athletes or six athletes their ability to handle uh, wheelchairs um, the smoothness of the operations uh, Yamato with a black cat, the way in which they worked was incredible. And the processing, the processing of the uh, the anti rapid antigen tests on a daily basis uh, was a, in, in just a sight to see. Um, you know, the change in atmosphere when we when we were there, I think when we looked at one of the things that from a from a uh, disability world perspective, when we looked at Suzuki uh, in the swimming, who only has one arm and that's even uh, a, a, a compromised arm, um, was just a, an uplifting thing. And I thought what was really lovely from my point of view as I watched the Japanese coverage, obviously in our village and in our um, in our headquarters um, was the Channel 7 feed from Australia. So it was very much the Australian feed. I went out of my way to watch a lot of the Japanese coverage and I hope you would agree with me that I think they gave it fantastic coverage of uh, people with a disability. And I really, my, my hope and my prayer and one of the things I'm working on as a legacy from 2020 now that I've finished uh, with the Australian Olympic Committee and the Paralympic Committee um, is the legacy from Tokyo 2020 will also bring together a diversity and an inclusion and a, and a society in Japan, which is starting to rapidly catch up with the rest of the world. And I can only speak from an Australian perspective um, of, as I said, diversity and inclusion um, and acceptance of all things that are different in society, um, whether they be LGBTQI, disabilities, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and that's one of the things I think that from a legacy point of view, um, I think is, is incredibly important. Um, I'll finish on this one point and then I'll open up. I've got a couple of other points that I've just written down here. Um, one of the, the, there was one thing which was my, my, my proudest moment, or there's two of my proudest moments from both the Olympics and the Paralympics game and the team that was behind me. Um, if anybody's watched uh, one of our Australian players, a lady by the name of Ash Barty, who won the Australian Open in tennis and Wimbledon, she has this incredible ability to talk only about her team. Um, and you never hear her use the words I or me. And I think that's a very, a very commendable uh, strength and uh, a positive attitude. Um, our team at Paralympics, we decided beforehand that we would do a fundraising throughout the telecast. Um, you may or may not have seen this, but um, we used uh, a concept that we came up with and that was called a virtual seat. And the virtual seat was a very simple concept is that you couldn't be at the Olympics. Nobody could be at the Olympics or the Paralympics. This was based on the Paralympics. This was aired throughout the coverage with Channel 7 here in Australia. We set a site, we set our sites that if we if we were able to sell 25, uh, sorry, yes, 200, uh, so $500,000 worth of seats, uh, virtual seats at $25 a seat. Uh, so the, the viewer would then hit the QR code or log in and buy a seat. Um, we excelled $2.35 million on that project. 
which really meant that one, um, we, had, we, we had the benefit of COVID where the Australians were at home and everybody was watching the Paralympics. And two, it showed you just how society is changing so rapidly for the acceptance of people with a disability. Um, the other one uh, was the project that uh, my team did during the, uh, the, the Olympics and leading up to the Olympics. And this is from a Japanese perspective, definitely my proudest moment. Uh, we started the only National Olympic Committee in the world that did this program. Uh, we started a project called Tomodachi Connect or Connect Tomodachi. And as you all know, Tomodachi means friend. Right? And we decided to use Zoom and as, as our partner. Um, and we decided to go through all of the Ministry of Education, the D Ministry of Foreign Affairs, all of the different government sources, etc., through the Australian Embassy. Right? And we wanted to link Australian schools between the Shogaku Gonensei and the uh, Ko Ichi, so year five in Australia to year 11 in, uh, sorry, year 10 in Australia. Um, we wanted to link Japanese and Australian schools via online communication in the spirit of Olympics and Paralympics. Uh, we set out to, we, we did a, pro, a pilot program in 2020, which was hugely su successful with 20 schools in Australia and 20 schools in Japan. We set out with the main one in early 2021, and, and we started without the help of all of those things, the Friends of Friends of Australia, which was uh, Urasa City, Fuchu City, you name it. There, there was 24 Friends of Australia throughout the prefectures and cities of Japan. And we set out, we, our goal was maybe 200 schools uh, in Australia, maybe 200 schools in, uh, 200 schools all up, 100 in Australia, 100 in Japan. We ended up with 611 classes, 20,000 kids between Australia and Japan uh, connecting through the spirit of Olympics and Paralympics. Uh, that program is now finished. And as far as legacy is concerned, I'm proud to say that I've actually, out my myself and what will be my team, have received a grant from the Australia Japan Foundation to continue that um, that program, which would form part of the uh, legacy of the Tokyo 2020. And I'm working with the Cabinet Secretariat in Japan uh, and my friend there, Mr. Yoshida, um, to try and create a legacy of actually now Australian and Japanese school students um, actually going visiting each other in person when it is possible to do so. So for me, I'll finish on this point and we can have a little bit of an open chat. Um, was very simply, I think about that 20,000 children between Australia and Japan, the feedback from the Japanese side, my most emotional feedback was receiving feedback from school children in Japan who said, quite honestly said, I never knew why I was learning English at school and now I know why I am. Is that I have the ability to actually exchange, even if it's online with people from another country. And, and from the Australian side of things, uh, was the Australian kids, and bear in mind that Japanese is the most taught a foreign language in Australia, uh, that we have, the Australian side of things was saying, I didn't realise that even though their kids are from another country and they're doing things, they're almost the same as us doing the same things at school, just the surroundings and the culture and the language are different. Uh, I thought about that and I thought about 20,000 children involved in this particular program and I thought to myself, if we even have just a small percentage of those children who go on to do something in the Australia-Japan relationship, then the, at the end of the day, I'll die a happy man. Yeah, I hear you tell that story. I'm always just so moved because that's really near and dear to my heart. I, you know, worked in kind of that area with kids from Japan to the U.S. So it's just such a beautiful thing you've done and you've created this lasting legacy. Um, I just, my head is off to you. I'm just, I'm very moved by that. So I just wanted to say that I can listen to Peter for ages. Because every, every story, Peter, that you, you talk about, you tell is so um, moving and... Um, I just, while I was listening to you, I thought that the general public, and I'm one of of the people who only watched the Olympics on uh, the TV screen, and I thought that, well, everything looks good and the logistics, uh, they look great, but we never actually realize how much um, effort and how much um, thought is put, is put there, you know, for everything to look uh, smooth on screen or to be going as well as it did. And it's only the people like you who actually um, work on this, uh, who know how hard all of that is, but how uh, rewarding it is at the same time. So what I can say is thank you for being one of those people who made the Olympics uh, possible and who made the Olympics what, and Paralympics uh, what they are. Oh, it's, as I said, it's not, it's not me, Timothy, it's a, it's a we. Um, and I really tried to actually, and I think I learned that very early on in my time um, 
in Japan. I mean, it's now 1985 was my first trip, this trip to the Paralympics. I, I know this is very sad and everybody will say, get a life, but I've actually counted how many times and it was my 87th trip to Japan. Um, I got out all my pa old passports with a bottle of red uh, one night. So uh, that, was a, that was a lot of fun and very reminiscent um, of all the times when I used to go to Japan when I had hair. Um, but let's not get down. Let, let's not let's not go down that path. Um, yeah, uh, beautiful blonde locks as, a, as a, it was in those days. Um, you know, we we had lots of uh, a lot of excitement. I, because I knew Tokyo quite well, um, they soon found out that uh, I was going to be one of the drivers um, amongst all the other things that I was going to do. And so I had the the pleasure of actually doing a lot of sort of VIP driving around Tokyo. We couldn't go out of the village. Um, we couldn't go out of our headquarters. We had. Uh, we used the Chuo Kuritsu Chugako in Harumi as one of our headquarters in the gym there, and that was fantastic. And I thank, I think I thank the uh, the Harumi Chugaku go there for their um, their support. And we set up a sort of a little breakout area in there. And we had uh, shuttle buses, etc. But I had uh, the pleasure of actually uh, taking our marathon team on a reconnaissance around Tokyo, uh, where we followed the green line. You may have seen the green line throughout Tokyo if anybody is living there. And uh, we followed the green line around, and that was fantastic because it actually took in all of the Japan sites, you know, Sozoji and uh, and up through Asakusa, you know, down through all those areas, etc. So, so it really was a, a great pleasure to do that but uh, i suppose the highlight there was we were coming up the uh, final hill um in the wheelchair so the the, wheel, the wheelchair athletes were in the car at that stage and um we're coming up the final hill at aoyama there before you go down the hill down into the kokuritsu kyogijo and uh we found that uh, and I turned around to the coach who was sitting in the seat next to me, and I said, "I said I think this, you know." And she she said, "Don't say it." She said, "This is this will be the heartbreak hill, um, and if my athlete, you know, who's a lovely girl by the name of Madison De Rosario, um, my athlete uh, can win this hill, she will win the gold medal." Uh, and the next day, I had the pleasure of being in the national stadium. Um, on the very last day of competition uh, and sure enough uh, she did uh, she won that hill at Aoyama uh, getting past her uh, Dutch opponent who was in front at the last just at the top of the hill and then run down into the stadium there and uh, won by three meters and won the gold medal um, the rest is history uh, I will share on that particular day one particular experience that will never ever uh, leave me um, so you've got to understand in marathon so the T12 uh, the T12 category is uh, for vision impaired athletes so the marathon 42 kilometers uh vision impaired athletes that was the beautiful to see the gold medal won by michiko michita uh, and she's 44 which i thought was pretty impressive at the time so those runners can run with a guide obviously uh they're tethered at the at the wrist with a, a band an elastic band but the guide can talk to them but they're obviously not allowed to touch or uh, to push them on or in any way shape or form assist in that way they can talk um and uh, Michiko, Mich uh, Michiko Michishita came through, won the gold, etc. It was brilliant. Things quietened down around the press box, etc. Things like that. And I, and the video that I'd like to share with you later on is of the last uh, 100 meters or 120 meters. Um, and <laughs> if you don't, if you don't cry watching this, then there's something particularly wrong with you. Um, the the athlete's name was Mihoko Nishijima. Mihoko was uh, competing in her fourth uh, Paralympic Games. Uh, Mihoko had just run 42 kilometers in a marathon. Uh, she was coming into the back straight. So I looked across and nobody else was noticing anything. I looked across as she entered the stadium uh, to my left hand side. And I saw a figure that there is no way on earth that I ever thought that this person would ever, I didn't know who it was. And there's no way on earth I thought this person was going to be able to complete the marathon. Uh, they were just about to collapse. It's amazing what the human body can do and then what the human body can do when you're blind. You cannot see. It just does my head in even talking about it now. Uh, Mihoko, when you come into the stadium, you then have to do another lap and a half of the Olympic Stadium. So that's another 600 metres. Mihoko comes around. We look, I, look, I don't think she can make it. I just don't think she's going to make it. She went down the far back end of the stadium. She comes around where the video starts are about 100, 150 metres from the finish line. Uh, Mihoko finishes. Uh, the, the, the thing almost almost passes out, is carried off, is dehydrated, uh, etc. Uh, Michiko Michishita won that marathon in three hours and thirty uh, three hours and fifty nine seconds flat. Uh, Mihoko Nishijima finished that uh, that marathon in three hours and thirty minutes. Mihoko uh, Mihoko Nishijima is sixty one years old. Um, and once I found that out, I just I was just blown away, blown away by what human beings can do the stories of a day-to-day -day basis in the village. We have two, uh, one particular athlete, um, and I'll share the video, the, uh, the, the photos, um, Ahmed Kelly. 
Armin Kelly was a, a an Iraqi uh, refugee um, and had both of his arms and legs blown off uh, during the conflict in Iraq uh, and then was taken in by an Australian family. Um, Ahmed came, got silver, uh, Kakutoku, in the uh, in the Paralympics. But the thing for me with Ahmed was just what a wonderful person he is, um, an incredible uh, man, an incredible athlete. Uh, he's in swimming. I, f I forgot to mention that. I beg your pardon. But uh, watching Ahmed and another uh, person with a disability play table tennis in the village, uh, way better than you and I could play, uh, was a sight to see. Uh, there is nothing that uh, these 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 Paralympians. Uh, cannot overcome and the quotes that came out whilst we were there uh, the ability you know the, the that they are like everything when it comes to for example my son uh, a lot of people will say things for example oh, you have a down syndrome boy no i have a boy with down syndrome it's a very careful a way in which we use our language um, these are dis these are not disabled athletes they are they are world-class athletes who happen to have a disability um, i had the pleasure of working with the table tennis team uh, we had to uh, we had to actually, the transition group, we actually had a number of, uh, the table tennis player was one who actually competed in the Olympics and the Paralympics. Uh, so, um, Philippa, her name was, we had the transition group, which I had to find a place for them to actually chill out and enjoy a little bit of Japan in between the Olympics and the Paralympics. Uh, I sent them to Shizuoka. I sent them to uh, a beautiful hotel in Mishima uh, that had an onsen on the, on the top floor that they could take in the views of Mount Fuji. It had to be a nice hotel. Um, and my friends at Tokyo Hotels uh, really looked after us there. Um, you know, I could go on the the amount of things that I would see on a day to day basis. Um, we had no cases of COVID, which was fantastic. We had one particular athlete who had to be hospitalised uh, through a, a a lung infection, which actually then got into the pancreas, uh, but that was fine. And we also had an accident on one of our cyclists in Izu on the last day where our oldest Paralympian, I think at 66, if I'm not mistaken, um, actually punctured a lung in a crash on the Izu cycleway. And obviously when you're puncturing a lung, you can't fly for a number of weeks. Um, our medal tally, Australia 8th, Japan um, 11th. I think that uh, you've only got to look at what happens uh, for Paralympic sport um, after a Paralympics is where Brazil finished uh, quite high on there after the Rio de Janeiro um, Paralympic Games. And I'm hoping that in Paris, Japan will actually do even better at the Paralympic Games. Um, I'm, I'm excited and looking forward to, and I hope everybody could join us. We now have Brisbane uh, in Australia 2032 for the Olympic and the Paralympic Games. And I hope that we're all around and we could all perhaps even catch up face to face uh, in uh, in Brisbane in the sunny Queensland uh, in 2032 for the uh, the Paralympic Games there. Um, it's really, I suppose, most of our, what I have to, to bring to you at the moment. And I think the pictures will speak a thousand words and I'm happy to share those links with and I'll put it into either a, a Dropbox or a, some 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 form of communication across a platform that I have no idea how it works. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, just one thing I, which um, really I thought was great you mentioned, Peter, was that, uh, well, there is definitely a much bigger acceptance, wider acceptance of uh, athletes with disability and people with disability nowadays. And I believe that it is in a larger part thanks to the uh, Paralympic Games, because uh, yeah, when we when we see uh, athletes uh, with disability uh, achieve all those things, which in a sense we perceive as something quite normal for people without disabilities, then we realize that they're indeed incredible human beings and probably much more uh, much stronger than we are. And I remember just this summer. Uh, it was the end of the summer, uh, my husband and I, we were walking here in Tokyo and um, uh, we passed uh, uh, by a, a person in a wheelchair and my husband commented like, I can see a lot of uh, people with disabilities nowadays, you know, uh, being out uh, and uh, just moving around around Tokyo. And I wonder whether we get, uh, you know, a, a bigger percentage of the population with disability nowadays. And um, I told him, well, there is no difference, you know, in that because uh, historically about 10% of the world population has some sort of disability. And it's not that this percentage has, has increased. It's that nowadays people with disabilities uh, feel, uh, how can I put it, more 
freedom to move around and to come out, you know, and uh, to go about their everyday lives without staying at home all the time. And um, so this is something which we have seen, thankfully, recently. And once again, I repeat myself, I'm sorry for doing this, but I believe that this normalization um, has been achieved thanks in a big part to the Paralympic Games, but also to people like you who work, you know, to normalize uh, um, these things here, uh, not only in Japan, of course, but in Australia and throughout the world. You echoed a lot of my sentiments. You know, I got to say, every time I listen to you, I get all teary eyed. I'm kind of glad we're not on Zoom, you know, um, <laughs> you know, just really, I, I love your stories and, you know, I can, I know they're from the heart. So thank you for that. And, you know, I, yeah, I think a lot, Japan gets criticized often or has been criticized often in the past for, you know, what people perceived as lack of perception, or, you know, lack of uh, inclusion. But as somebody who first came to Japan in 1977, and then I left in 87, I came back 30 years later, the progress is much probably more apparent to me um, because I left and I came back and there is progress. I'm not saying, you know, but I see much more, more facilities, you know, to Maya's point of uh, folks with disabilities being able to move more freely. Some of that, it has been helped by more access, more ramps. Um, and again, I can see them, which I never saw them in, I, I didn't see it that much back in the 70s and even even through most of the 80s. So my point is, it's, I, I, see, I do see pro progress and it is folks like Peter and Peter on your team and all the other kind of unsung heroes that are doing all these activities. So yeah, a big thank you and, for that. And from a from an infrastructure point of view, Tim, it's a very good point. When you actually get down and you work with our, you work with our infrastructure team and you work with the athletes as to what they actually need and how it actually done. Japan is arguably one of the most difficult countries in the world to create a barrier free infrastructure. Uh, it, it's just, you know, when you've got a country where only 27% of it is habitable and, and you're doing a lot of underground and above ground mo uh, movement, it becomes a very, very difficult place. And I remember, as you say, Tim, you know, 85, 86, 87, wasn't any difference in the population. It was just, it was out of sight, out of mind, uh, to be brutal about it. And um, yes, 15% of the world's population uh, has experiences a form of disability. So, you know, it's, it's, it's getting there. The, the Parasports, um, which is funded by the Parasports Academy, which is funded by the Japan Foundation, um, which is a legacy of the Nippon Yusen Kaisha, um, which sits out in Harumi, uh, I beg your pardon, in Odaiba, uh, and that area there is certainly worth the visit. And it's certainly something that Japan can be very proud of. And that's, they've got one of those, uh, those Parasports centers, which actually brings all the sports, all the Paralympic sports together into one hub, uh, which we're trying to actually copy here as we do that. Um, as, as I've said before, and I just want to make it absolutely clear so that nobody's misled here. Um, so my contracts have actually completed with the Australian Olympic Committee and the uh, and the Paralympics Australia. So I'm not in any position to speak on either of those organisations behalf at this time. But uh, I've certainly uh, certainly will never forget my time uh, as, as in uh, in Tokyo, a very different time from a personal perspective and quite a selfish perspective to be in Harumi there, which was just over the over there from over the way from Shimbashi, which has some of my favorite izakaya on the planet. Uh, you know, it was a, it was very difficult. And it was I wanted wanted to take so many of the Paralympians out to show them by Tokyo. But unfortunately, we weren't able to do so. Yes, the infrastructure has uh, been uh, developed here quite a lot. Of course, I was not here in the 70s uh, or in the, not in the 90s either, but for the 20 years uh, of uh, my time here in Japan, I mean, yes, there's a very big difference, uh, an advancement in uh, how things, I mean, the stations, the underground stations, uh, train stations, they have been improved for uh, people with disabilities. Access has been improved, but I, also one thing which I uh, want to say is that uh, people have become more accepting of uh, you know others, those who have this some some sort of disability here as well, so that normalization is a very big step forward, and uh, in some to a certain extent, it's even uh, more important uh, than um, the infrastructure. Even though infrastructure is, of course, without infrastructure you don't have access, and you cannot have people with disability moving uh, disabilities moving around. So, but uh, Japan has made uh, really great strides forward in both senses, developing its infrastructure and developing its acceptance on a psychological, uh, psychological level here. So, um, the Peter, I just wanted to, uh, you know, the thank you for being here again. Your first earlier room was one of my uh, early rooms that I have joined with Maya and Timothy. And then you have really made a great impression on me about you and, you know, these 
uh, like, you know, these moderators and the clubhouse. So thank you for that. And actually I have <laughs> not seen the, you know, video above because if I, if I see that I'm going to cry and I'm, I know I cannot talk. So, <laughs> um, you may not remember this, but, but my question to you then was, you know, you said, you know, all athletes were participating in the, in the games last year. And then, you know, back then, a lot of people were anxious and they worried about the safety and no one, you know, could blame them. And so mm -hmm. I asked you, like, uh, you know, the, all those athletes, were they willing participants or, you know, they, they, were, they were being coerced to join mm -hmm. the Olympics? And you said, you know, everybody were willing participants. And then mm -hmm. I was very grateful then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yuka, it's a, it's a good question. I actually remember our conversation. Um, and there was, as I said, one of the key ones was that, yes, there was apprehension. Um, we made a carte blanche decision across the organisation that we would not take any um, athletes uh, who were not vaccinated. Uh, and that was that caused a few problems because we did actually have a number of athletes who uh, we did not want to become vaccinated for their own reasons, and I respect that. Uh, but they they, they uh, we did not take them in the team. Um, but every single athlete was there. Uh, the excitement was just palpable. It was to to be in that village, you know, when the in the first day or the second day, and particularly when you know we had um, the entire avenue down there, which had every flag of every country participating, going all the way down into Tokyo Bay there. And um, to have the Australian team, you know, have a guard of honour for our flag bearer and uh, and our flag bearers uh, for the closing ceremony um, was just an incredible. Their experience was exceptional. Um, we did a lot of stuff. You know, well, my team did a lot of stuff in the background. Um, it was a bit sort of ironic sometimes because we would do uh, virtual tours of Asakusa, and I thought, "Oh, really? Is that? Do we need to do that? I mean, that's almost like really teasing somebody. You know, here we have Asakusa is 30 minutes away, and you're wanting to do a virtual tour, but they had never been to Japan before, and so we had to make it, um, a, you know, a virtual tour of Mount Fuji. But uh, in answer to your question, you could very simply, there was not a not a single athlete nor official in the team. Um, who didn't want to be there, and in many ways were there with passion. Again, thank you. You know, you know, like uh, Japan has been criticized, or somehow in media, like I'm, I'm, um, I think I'm, you know, more exposed to negative news. But now, you know, so I'm, um, thank you again for sharing those positive news. And, you know, thank you. I think one of the most important parts of actually what comes out of this, and I know that there's domestic, uh, domestic positive results that have come out of the Paralympics in, in Tokyo. Um, the the positive results and the positive image that was expressed and displayed around the world uh, of Japan, uh, and especially if you remember both the opening and the closing ceremonies of the Paralympics, I actually, in my personal opinion, uh, were way more diverse. They were a little bit more out there uh, from the, the the Japanese side of things, which I enjoyed and I liked uh, because uh, you don't, you just, people have a sort of a stereotype image of Japan, especially from overseas. And I think that was one of the things which I was most proud of, um, I suppose, having Japan as my second home, that the way in which the image of Japan expressed to the outside world was so positive, so inclusive, so diverse, it changed a lot of people's mindset of that stereotypical Japanese, you know, salary man and all that sort of stuff, etc. And it was really, really wonderful to see that feedback from, uh, from the other side of the lens, if you like. Thank you for your, your question and your comment. Luke, you're up, my friend. You no, know, I appreciate the, the, uh, the sharing of your experiences, Peter. It, it's, um, it's, it's good to hear a different perspective. Um, I, I've been in Japan here some time, and, and uh, with, the, um, uh, with the Olympics, we, I'd uh, applied for a ticket to, and uh, was taking the family to the, uh, to the, the men's bronze uh, uh, soccer match. Um, and, uh, of course, we, we didn't go, so... Already, even before the Paralympics have, have, have kicked off, there was a um, kind of a, a sour mood. Um, and it, look, that's not only from our, our, you know, my family's perspective. It's, it's, it's from a lot of people, right? So uh, who couldn't go? And um, I, I think the thing that I really enjoyed from the Paralympics. So look, we had um, uh, Japan's uh, like a men's national uh, soccer captain come to um, the local shogaku that my daughter goes to. And um, you could feel the mood, like actually the parents were invited to go as well. So I took, I went, you know, went along, um, you know, you take the opportunity, you don't get to, to see, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, that kind of thing so often. And, and just the, the mood of the, the kids, um, you know, to see someone play soccer when he's, he's an amputee, he's got, he's, he's missing his right leg, um, you know, and everyone's sort of, you know, all hushed and, and, you know, and to see him actually kick a soccer ball, 
Um, and he, he he lays into the ball pretty hard. And just the, the whole mood of, of, of change, you could feel you could feel a sense of appreciation that the athletes um, and the training that they go through to get to this stage. And there was kind of a shift at the school. I had some of my uh, parents sort of say the same thing. And um, like you mentioned, sort of coverage on TV and, and just the whole, uh, you know, the way it was uh, conducted, I think, with the Paralympics, uh, that put the, a, a positive edge on a pretty hard uh, road to the Olympics for Japan, I think, in, in my personal view, because we've had everything from, you know, um, uh, directors that have, that have you know, uh, decided to step down. <laughs> we've had uh, the, the Mori Sun saga. Um, you know, it, it was just, it was a snowball effect, and that's not even without talking about COVID. So, um, yeah, I, I think the legacy for me, I always, I have questioned that. And, and a friend said to me, oh, you know, well, at least with Japan, you've got some, uh, I hope, you know, it's, 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 it was good. At least you've got some, you know, quality Olympic venues. And I sort of really felt, God, there has to be something more than just Olympic ve- venues. And, and what is the benefit? What was the benefit of the Olympics? And then having the conversation today to see it from a different perspective and then see my daughter react to, uh, you know, seeing those, um, you know, the Paralympians and, and, and sitting down and watching the swimming together and, and, you know, marathon runners and people playing table tennis with their, you know, with, with their the mouth. Mouth. Yeah, it was amazing. It was really amazing. And, and I think that was the, for me, just to see the change in people um, after the, the, I don't know, I, I, I don't know how you say it these days, because that's made me think is what is the normal Olympics? It's, I'd like to think as all as one. And I think that's the, been the shift. I think people have, the inclusion of the Paralympics as really a, a one, it has to be one, you know. I think that's that. That would be the legacy for Tokyo. I think it's, it's the both of them have been drawn closer together, um, you know, uh, in my view. Yeah, I I, I agree with you, Luke. And I, I think what, if anybody had the chance to see the blind five aside soccer, um, just was seriously just mind blowing as to how skilled uh, these soccer players are and how committed they are. And 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 that's the same. You know, we we talk. We had wonderful quotes there. That Madison de Rosario, who won the gold medal, is that you know, there's people with a disability have got to be you know got to be proud to to be taking up this space in the world and that's where it's a bit of a mind shift too is to actually taking this and so we talk about participation in uh, paralympics about you know it's not like it's not like a situation you go and do a try come and try day and you have 50 able-bodied kids turn up to play a particular sport etc this is a specific thing that you're talking about of actually taking kids who either one uh, uh, have a genetic genetic uh, disability or two have an acquired injury uh, and now you're t- talking about turning those into bringing them the benefits of sport. And we all know I won't even start to get down, go down that track. Um, it was a little ironic. Some of the comments that I had uh, in that in that sometimes there was crowds that were allowed to go to the baseball and the J-League soccer. And I believe even Kar- Natsuno Koshien was on at that time. Um, but uh, the, 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 the interest, I'll, I will share another document to you. And this is um, just one of my slight um, frustrations with Japan, um, if you'll excuse me to, to say it. Um, TOKOG, in conjunction with the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, has, uh, has um, now just uh, um, issued or uh, published a, a document on the memories. It's called Memories to the Future. Um, which I'm always a little bit worried about these catch cries in Japanese publications because if you look through the document, I just wish they would get somebody who is a native speaker to check it before they publish it oh. uh, because it obviously comes through. And it's not a problem. You get the understanding. You get the understanding of the document. However, it just sometimes could need a little bit of finessing. But it gives you a, a real um, a real cross-section of the benefits to Tokyo and Japan as a whole. Um, when you think about Rio, for example, it was only what's that now, six years ago. Um, it was only two weeks, if you ever get an, uh, an opportunity, and I think I may have mentioned it, uh, Rising Phoenix um, was an op- is, uh, is on Netflix, and it's based around the Rio Paralympics, and it's an incredible, incredible, please, please, please watch that documentary um, about the Paralympics, and in particular focused on Rio. Two weeks out from the Rio uh, uh, Paralympics, the Rio Organising Committee of the Olympic and Paralympic Games was bankrupt. There was no money and there was a real chance that the Paralympic Games was going to be cancelled. Um, that sort of thing never happened in Japan. And I'm so pleased that, it, uh, that, that we didn't have that same. But, but be sure that every Paralympics and Olympic Games ever in history has been plagued by controversy before the opening ceremony. Uh, and then when the opening ceremony does happen, uh, that spirit of Olympics and that spirit of Paralympism that brings people together actually shines through. And I think that's just exactly the same as what happened in Tokyo. And more so, um, I hope, that it does flow on. As I said, uh, I'm working hard on the, and for those of you who are in the room, and this is a blatant advertisement, 
um, is that, that I am running this uh, Connect Tomodachi program, which is linking Japanese schools to schools overseas. So um, we're looking at exchange programs. So if anybody has any thoughts or they've got schools that would in, in Japan or sports organisations or language schools uh, that would like to uh, either visit Australia or have Australian schools visit them uh, as part of this Connect Tomodachi to Tokyo 2020 legacy, please reach out to me. Thank you. I, I just quickly, um, I think it's a really great uh, initiative and I, uh, because Having a, a daughter in the Japanese public school, um, yeah, there, there's, you know, she, she's the only, uh, she on, she's the only foreigner there, so it, it's it's always difficult for for her friends, you know, to make the, the connections of like what you said previously, uh, you know, the, the reason for learning English or about other cultures, and I think if you can, yeah, help kids connect with other with other cultures, um, I, I think it's got a, uh, you know, so many benefits or unseen benefits down the line that, uh, yeah, uh, I think it's a really great effort. I'd, I'd really love to have a, a chat about that uh, sometimes, Peter. Thank you. More than welcome. It was such a shame we had a program which was going to take para Australian Paralympians out to a number of, uh, it was about 24 schools in the Tokyo area um, before obviously COVID restricted us on that, which would have been a wonderful experience because I was actually um, leading that team to organise those school visits. It was such a shame we weren't able to actually uh, do that, which was, I suppose, one of my bigger regrets. Yeah, that's a shame indeed, but hopefully there will be other other opportunities in a couple of years once the pandemic yeah. is over too. So, Yeah, and, and Peter, what, what I believe is the greatest gift you're giving these kids is, I think once you make human connections, that becomes a strong motivation for people to learn the language. That's how it was yeah. with me. Yeah. And just having that motive, because we all know any of us who have learned to speak another language knows that it's your internal motivation of wanting to learn um, that keeps you going and, and makes you get better. And to me, that's my philosophy about the kids. If you could get yeah. them to connect as humans, and again, to Luke's point and both of your points, make them understand why. And really, that, the why is human connections, I, I believe, right? So, you know, God bless you for that. No, thanks, mate. It was um, it was it was certainly not a, it was not a chore in any way. It was not a difficult job. I mean, when you if you if you go onto Facebook and you'll see the Connect Tomodachi uh, Facebook page where the, the kids are sharing posts or the teachers are sharing posts about you know a school in outback Australia you know uh, exchanging online with a school in downtown you know um, Mitaka City in uh, Western uh, Tokyo. And it just really blows you away. You know, that's the, the innocence of that exchange. And you are right, Tim. Um, when I first fell in love with the Japanese language, uh, it was, that, it was that, that drive to actually connect with people and to have conversations with people and to share those exchanges of ideas. And I think that's helped sort of shape um, sort of where I've come to. Obviously, I definitely don't think, I know it's definitely helped shape where, uh, where I've come to today. So, Peter, I have a quick question. You said earlier that a Japanese, the most taught foreign language, I'm sorry, Timothy, uh, I, I cut in. Uh, it, 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 is that true? Can I, did I that's, hear right? That's correct. That's correct, Yuka. That's, uh, wow. Yes, um, we, have, we have approximately 200,000 students. Um, we have almost uh, 2,000 Japanese language teachers, and it's the most common. And the, one little sideline, it's actually the most common uh, taught foreign language in our primary, secondary, and tertiary system. From, from primary, wow. No wonder there are many Australians who are fluent in Japanese. Okay, well, thank you. That really, you know, have made me happy. Thanks. Peter, to you, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful conversation, inspiring. You're always an inspiration. Uh, that's what <laughs> Yes, always. And... Uh, Thank you, Yuka and Luke, for coming up on stage and uh, talking uh, with, uh, with us about uh, your impressions and your experiences uh, here in Japan. Thank you for coming and staying with us today. We will be on air next week on Thursday at 8 a.m. Japan time again. So join us. Until then, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel where we upload all the conversations on Japanese politics, business insights, and the role of Japan in the Indo-Pacific region. If you want to stay informed about our upcoming events, you can follow us on Clubhouse, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Again, we're looking forward to your joining us next week. Until then, stay well and make the best of the day. See you.